Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with the one and only Alan Pestaluki. What's going on? Hey, I'm super excited to be here. So excited for this. Yeah. Uh, take it away. Nice. Thanks. So hi, friends. Thank you for joining me on the very first Dirty Rectangles Online. Super stoked to be here. Um, so today I want to show off a uh, vector video game engine that I've been working on. Uh, so it's a video game engine that renders to vector displays. Um, vector displays are something that really have enamored me for a long time because of the old Asteroids arcade game. Um, you can do some interesting things with them, but first I'm going to kind of explain what they are and how they work and what I'm doing with them. Um, so a vector display is different than a raster display. Um, a raster display will draw to the screen line by line. <clears throat> a vector display draws just in any arbitrary motion. motion. And that's really, uh, it's, it's, it's very, it's kind of a totally different paradigm for drawing images to a screen. Um, and so, yeah, you can just draw, move this, this kind of, it's like drawing, a, moving a pen around while you're doing calligraphy and you just draw to the screen. Uh, so uh, on the screen, you can actually see me drawing this, uh, this cube shape. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm moving an electron beam around the screen, uh, rendering at 80 frames per second. So it'll draw one frame, it'll draw the cube in one position, and then it'll rotate slightly and draw it in another position and rotate it slightly and continue doing that. Um, and I actually have it so that it, it blanks. So that means that it turns off the electron beam uh, in between uh, different lines that it's drawing. <clears throat> now, I'm not turning it totally off because some technical details I can get into in a moment. Um, so if I turn up the intensity, you can actually see there the uh, the electron beam as it goes from the bottom left. That's where I'm moving the electron beam when I'm done my frame, but I'm waiting to start the next frame. So I just move it off screen. And so you can see there with those little faint lines, that's where the electron beam is moving between the different shapes. All right. So um, yeah, so that's that's kind of the idea of how I'm drawing frame by frame that cube. Um, <clears throat> but I want to get into a little bit more details on uh, the inner workings of a CRT and like a CRT vector display. Um, so the way that a CRT works is you've got an electron beam that shoots against the screen. The screen has a bunch of phosphors and they light up because of the, the electrons that are bombarding the phosphors. Um, now, uh, so again, of the electron beam, uh, I'm steering it around. The way that I'm steering it is using, in the case of this uh, oscilloscope, uh, using electrostatic deflection, um, but you can also steer it like in a normal CRT TV or like in the Asteroids arcade machine, um, you can steer it using magnetic deflection. Um, so magnetic deflection is actually very similar to the um, uh, speakers that we're all used to uh, listening through. Uh, so a speaker has got a magnetic coil and you send a voltage to that magnetic coil and it'll move the, as the voltage goes high, it moves the speaker one cone one way. As the voltage goes low, it moves the speaker cone another way. Um, and uh, CRT, uh, it works pretty much the exact same way, uh, except it has two channels, uh, one for the y-axis, one for the x-axis. And as the uh, the deflection for the y-axis gets, uh, you know, changed by voltage, uh, the electron beam moves up, up, up and down on the screen or left and right. And you can basically steer that electron beam around the screen like it's an Etch-a-Sketch. Um, so then the question is, well, how am I generating my voltage that is driving this electron, uh, driving the deflection of the electron beam? Um, and there's actually a really easy way to do this. And this inspiration comes um, from a guy, I think his name is... Uh, Oh, I'm not going to say it because I'm going to butcher it. But instead, take a look uh, on Google for oscilloscope music. That was where the inspiration for this type of uh, technology that I'm using comes from. Um, oscilloscope music is music that is designed to both sound good and then also look good on an oscilloscope. So when you pump the voltage that is the music, uh, the audio stream for the music, into the oscilloscope, it creates interesting images on that oscilloscope. Um, so basically, I'm doing something similar. I'm using an audio device to output a voltage to my oscilloscope. So on my computer, I render an audio stream and that audio stream plays out to my, or gets sent out to my audio DAC, my digital analog converter. So then the uh, digital analog converter put, sends out an analog signal that is just like sound that you can listen to with headphones. Um, or I can plug it into my oscilloscope and now it drives the electron beam. So left channel is going to be the x-axis, right channel is going to be the y-axis, and that's how I steer my electron beam around. So just to be visual about it, 
Um, there you can see that's my oscilloscope and then also my audio interface, um, as well as all the cables that I got wired up there. So that's, that's what you're seeing. All right. Um, yeah, so I think that that kind of describes the basics of what I'm doing there. Um, so I'm going to move on to show you some other demos that I have. Uh, so this was just a simple cube. This is actually what I started out with, uh, the very first thing that I drew. Um, now I'm going to show you another shape. Uh, this one's kind of a fun one. Um, so this here is, uh, it's, it's drawing, again, I'm running it, this is a, my engine runs at 80 frames per second right now, but it is a variable frame rate, so if it takes too long to draw something on the screen, well then that frame just took longer. Um, so if I have more shapes added to the scene, well, that means that, you know, it's going to take longer per frame. And then eventually you'll start to get a flicker once you get it down to around like 40 Hertz is when I start seeing it. Um, and, uh, yes, yeah, so that's, that's the idea of the variable frame rate in my engine. So again, 80 frames per second is what this is running at right now. And each frame, it will draw the shape and you'll notice that there's one really, really bright point. So that bright point, um, and... I'm just going to, uh, for the clarity here, I'm actually just going to pause some stuff. Uh, pause it at a good point. Wait for it to rotate back a little bit here. So pause that there. Um, and so you can see, yeah, this is just a rotation that I had in my game engine that was going there. And then I'll also pause, um, pause the animation here just for clarity's sake. Um, so this is just repeating that exact same image over and over and over again on the screen. And what you can see here is there's a point that's, that's really, really bright. Now, unfortunately, what I love so much about vector displays is exactly what you guys cannot see. Um, it, because you're not using a vector display, you're using like an LCD screen or whatever you're watching this on. And when I look at this, I see a point of light that's very, very bright. Uh, it's a very, very high contrast. And it's not something that's easy to reproduce on other types of displays without burning out the display. You can get kind of close with like a high dynamic range OLED display, but again, you're probably going to burn it out pretty quick if you tried to get the kind of contrast uh, that I'm able to achieve here with this, uh, this vector display with these phosphors. So how am I lighting it up so bright? Well, the simple answer, it's actually quite simple. I just leave the electron beam on that point for a very long time. And the longer I leave that on that point, the brighter it becomes because those phosphors just get saturated with these ele this electron, the electrons that are hitting it. Um, so... Uh, to draw this shape, at the very start, I spend a long time drawing that first little curve, and then as I move along, I spend less and less time drawing the rest of the shape until it finishes, and then onto the next frame. Again, very, very, very slow at the beginning, and then continue going along. Um, and that's how I get this effect of a really bright point, and then kind of this decreasing brightness, it's just because it's drawing the rest of it faster. Uh, every single frame, one eightieth of a second. Um, yeah, so that's that's the gist of how this shape works. Um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 kind of cool effects that you can uh, that you can achieve with this. This this shape that I'm actually drawing here, I'm actually it's it's just a circle. But then I'm just adding on to the x y coordinates that I'm creating. Um, just adding on lots of other little samples. Uh, another thing maybe to to throw here throw out here is that um, I'm generating in software, 192,000 samples per second. So that's the audio uh, sample rate. Um, and that means that there's 192,000 of these points that I'm defining on the screen uh, that tells the electron beam, move here, move here, move here, move here, 192,000 times a second. And that's what, and then also the audio DAC has a little bit of smoothing in it, so it creates these nice uh, transitions, smooth transitions between each of these 192,000 uh, samples that happen every single second. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the gist of how this is working. Um, yeah, move on to the next shape, uh, the next little demo. So I do want to create a video game engine that runs on vector displays. So here's something that's kind of like a little bit more of a, um, 
a video game type scene. I've got this kind of first person type controller and I can move it around and, uh, you know, it's, it's a full 3d video game engine. The way what I'm using, uh, for my software is I'm using .NET, Um, and I'm using a couple of classes, just a couple of classes from the mono game framework, as well as an ASIO, uh, audio driver wrapper that works in .NET. And that's how I'm interfacing with the audio device. Um, So yeah, something that's a little bit more like a, a video game engine. If I go over here, especially when the tops and bottoms of these cubes are drawing, uh, this is where the frame rate really starts to tank because it's trying to draw too much, especially because I'm drawing all these lines really slowly right now. Um, and so I can see a flicker. You probably eh, you can, might be able to see it on stream a little bit as well. Um, yeah, and, and this scene also shows a little bit of some post-processing that I've got going on on these cubes. It's like a strobe post-processing where it cuts out parts of the cube. And the inspiration that, that uh, or the reason that I created this whole uh, post-processing effect that cuts out parts of the object is because I thought this might be a clever way to reduce the amount that I'm trying to draw at the screen. So if I got get to the point where I'm trying to draw too much on the screen, well, if I only draw part of the shape at a time, now I've got more headroom to draw other things to the screen because I only have a certain amount of things that I can draw before I run out of time um, and I really should get on to drawing the next frame. Otherwise, it'll start looking like it's flickering. Okay. And here's another fun shape that I created. So this is, again, a post-processing. And this one's kind of fun to play around with. So I think, uh, oops, I accidentally rotated. So I'm just going to restart that to give us a nicer view of it. Um, So this shape here is actually just kind of like a curly thing that's curling upwards. And I have a post-processing effect that's just disabling the samples at certain x coordinates. So I can go and kind of configure these in uh, different ways. Like, for example, I can make it go really fast. Um, Ooh, that's that's super fast. Maybe maybe not so fast. Um, eh, Still very fast. About, there we go. So yeah, I can change the speed of that or whatever. Um, I can change some other numbers. Just, you know, it's a video game engine. They're numbers. So there's one where it it just strobes really slow. you know, it's a large strobe or whatever you want to say. Um, I could go to, yeah, that was, that was kind of neat. So it's kind of some interesting effects that you can do just with post-processing. Um, and the way that my post-processing works is that it's, uh, each individual sample gets passed to a post-processor uh, either at the 3d state or at the 2d screen space state. And I can do all types of effects. Um, yeah, so that's that's some of the things. And I have a little basic editor that I've written, and I'm not showing that today because I don't have enough time to go into that detail. And also, I think I'm going to throw it all away and do something else because the one, I wrote, wrote it in WPF uh, over like a day or two, and it's the start of something, but I immediately I started having issues with multi-threading. So I'm just going to ditch that and go with a single-threaded, like built into the engine, maybe using uh, Dear I Am GUI. Um, anyway, uh, okay, but I know that. All y'all here, you're all here to um, see video games. So I started work on a video game. So this here is kind of like a a little, uh, well, I mean, it's not much of anything. Um, You can kind of move this spaceship around. Um, And I didn't really get to any interactions. I just started this a couple of days ago. Um, But I did have a little bit of a, uh, you know, a post-process effect that when you run into things, like if I run into these shapes, then you, uh, the little, like the big kind of curly ones. Yeah. You, you guys can see it. Um, so yeah, this is, this is the gist of it. You can also see here, um, the video capture kind of shows how bright those points are that are inside the rotating cubes that are flying at you. Um, and in, in person, it's the spectacle that I really want to create with this with this game engine these kind of really super bright points of light um so there's a lot more that i can do um in terms of not just like effects like the post-processing effects of like running into these things um but also uh, i can do all types of other effects with really bright points of lights and that's what i want to experiment with next um i've got a couple more things to show just about the inner workings of this level um if anybody was uh, paying close attention to the visuals of this scene, you might be able to take a guess that, like many other people, I've been playing Animal Crossing. 
Um, so, of course, uh, now that I mentioned that, maybe some of you noticed that the world curves off into the distance. Um, and so that curving is, it's basically made to just look similar to um, Animal Crossing. Um, so that's actually a post-processing effect that I created where it, it basically is just polar coordinates. Um, so there's without the polar coordinate uh, post-processing, and there's with. So without it, you can see that the objects are popping in uh, in the distance there. They just kind of appear and pop into existence. And so the great thing about this Animal Crossing style world wrapping is that now you have them come up over the horizon. And you don't really need to have fog at that point. You just They just kind of naturally come into view. And that's a really nice way of having that kind of fog. It's almost like fog. Um, yeah, so that, I think, is pretty much the gist of what I wanted to show tonight. Um, and I'm so excited to be able to finally show it uh, at a Dirty Rectangles meetup, which is, uh, which is exactly where I want to demo this kind of thing. So thank you all for coming. Um, I guess that's been my 15-minute slot. So if, uh, I don't know, it's up to the organizer if you guys want to jump in and if there's any questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, Someone, someone's got to have a question here. Holy yeah, shit, Alan! Yeah, Before we get to questions, can I just can I just take a hot second here? Uh, <laughs> I've, I've been looking forward to this. When you when you switched from rotating cube to fucking video game, uh, <laughs> I just about lost it a little bit, and I think so did basically everyone else in the chat. This yeah, is this so is, cool. Rocking. This is top tier rectangles, like some of the best. Like this is like classic crazy like 90s hacker shit that like we love this yeah. is like this, this is incredible <laughs> thanks guys you guys are my family with this stuff i love it <laughs> wow okay so uh, i've uh, got a question for alan yeah we've got a few um sean leblanc uh was asking um have you tried listening to the actual audio signal that goes into oh making my God. scenes or my is bad. it basically noise i totally I, I totally had my headphones right here so you could listen to it oh my god So you can kind of hear that's, like that's gonna be the track. yeah, as things get kind of like close to uh, the camera and things like that, the audio signal changes quite a bit. Um, the kind of harshness, the buzzing noise is mostly because I'm blanking, so it's going off screen. So that's very much like a hard, uh, kind of like almost like a square wave type signal. That's where you get the buzzing. But <laughs> yeah, that's that's what you hear, and that's pretty much the same sound as what you would hear um, in all of the other demo scenes. I don't think it's substantially different. I'm not going to reload different scenes just to basically have a similar kind of audio sound. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the old uh, vector graphics game, uh, Major Havoc. I'm not. I should look into it. I am just really not well. Uh, I didn't grow up in the era. And so like, it's just like I randomly find some reference and somebody mentions something to me. So I'm going to look this one up now. <laughs> yeah, me too. stuff like the uh, the Vectrex and all these old vector monitor games, they're all before my time. But um, it was like a little while ago that I started looking into it on YouTube and stuff like that. And it's really interesting to look at because obviously raster graphics, you know, really took over. And that's what we're all used to looking at these days. But if you ever get the chance to really look at one of these vector monitors in real life, um, mm. I think it's a, a great experience for everyone to have. It truly looks different. Yeah, look for asteroids. Uh, House of Targ actually has an asteroids cabinet, but right now it's under repairs. I'm not sure. Well, the thing I was going to say is even something like asteroids is fairly simple and straightforward. But if you look at they really start making some uh, pretty sophisticated games with these monitors. Um, Sega made a game called uh, TAC, some number I can't remember. But just what I really love about them is that back in those days when the raster graphics, the sprite-based games, had to be so simple, uh, vector monitor games really managed to portray these like extremely dynamic, like, uh, like uh, 3D scenes that you just couldn't see in any other mm -hmm. game. But yeah, yeah no, I definitely recommend looking up um, Major Havoc, where okay. it, it actually transitions from like a shooter scene, and then it like zooms all the way into the guy in the cockpit of the spaceship, and then he has to like run around inside of space stations and stuff like that. Really amazing stuff. Yeah, when you yeah, consider yeah. like the time when it was made, like just absolutely awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, jumping in, Alan. Uh, it looks even better at 80 frames than it does in the t in the Twitch stream, and it looks super cool in the Twitch stream. So great Rockin', work, rocking. <laughs> cool. 
Cool. All right, Alan, thank you so much. Let's get some let's get some claps in the chat. Get some claps from the organizers here. Thanks, cool. guys. So, throw down get the a next person of, set up. A couple of pops in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, we'll see you soon.